Um, tonight's meeting, as you're probably aware, is too much too soon um, on the issue of early, early childhood. We have two speakers and a short film tonight. Um, the speakers are Richard House and Simon Boxley, but they will say um, more about themselves when, when, when they're speaking. Um, before I start, just a couple of things to let you know that we have Richard's book here um, down the front. If you would like to come and purchase it at the end of the meeting, it's £20. And there's also some other books on education that, um, that bookmarks have here as well. Um, but without further ado, I'll hand this over to Richard. OK, um, we've only got, we're only speaking for 35, 40 minutes because what's much more important is for us to have a conversation. Um, my name is Richard House. I've recently retired from lecturing in early childhood at the University of Winchester. Um, I'm a trained Steiner, Waldorf um, kindergarten and class teacher. I've been campaigning on early years for about 15 to 20 years. Um, and um, I just wanted to start by just asking, how many people here um, actually work in, in the early years? Can we just have a sense of... Oh, okay, so about half, half, okay, that's, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, I'm sorry that, that we are two men here, because uh, talking about early years just doesn't seem to be particularly kind of appropriate for us to be two men, but that's how it's, how it's turned out. Um, uh, on your chair you'll see a handout uh, which has got a lot of material about the baseline assessment, it's got an article that I wrote in 2008 called um, Audit Culture and Play, I might say a bit about that a bit later, and it's got some useful resource uh, websites um, on, the, on page six, so I hope you find that helpful. Um, I'm going to start by showing a film, and I'm sorry if you've seen this film before, it's the Open Eye film from 2008, and um, it's not, uh, or you can watch it at several levels. You can watch it as a, as a kind of historical document, but actually, um, it's actually becoming more and more relevant with what's happening in the early years uh, at the moment, which Simon and I are going to be speaking about uh, this evening. So, uh, without uh, any further uh, ado, I hope. Do, do you know how to start this film? I don't. Simon, do you know how to start this film? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as a mother, I think it's, it's very scary. I hate the fact that it's a, a one-size-fits-all. I'm really concerned about the prescriptiveness. I don't think it's the place of the government to impose from above a very particular model of learning. what the EYFS is actually demanding that people like me are objecting to. I think the first thing that's important is to realise that it's only a very small part of the EYFS. A lot of it is brilliant. I'm all for it. The part we're objecting to are the learning goals. The learning goals say children before they reach the age of five not just hopefully will but should achieve all of the following. Enjoy using spoken and written language. Read a range of familiar words and simple sentences independently. <coughs> Write their own names, labels, captions, and begin to form simple sentences, some of them with punctuation. Have you ever seen a four-year-old punctuate? <laughs> and then we're on to numeracy. Say and use number names in familiar contexts. Recognize written numbers one to nine. Complete a simple computer program. Now, most people who've ever had any dealings with small children know that the vast majority of four to five year olds do not do all these things, and many of them don't do any. So what it's doing is to set children up for failure before they've even started compulsory schooling. I 
I worked for several years with the National Literacy Strategy, and we helped set the goals, which eventually became the goals in the EYFS for literacy. In fact, it now appears, in retrospect, that they were quite wrong, because instead of helping to raise standards, I believe firmly, instead of many other people involved in literacy, that they are counterproductive. They are meaning that children aren't making the progress that they could. What I saw when I travelled in Finland and, uh, and watched their excellent early years practice was a lot of play, a lot of talk, a huge amount of music, art, drama. These are the foundations on which you can build children's education. When I've, I've talked to teachers, um, nursery teachers in, in Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, um, and tell them that we start our children so soon on literacy, you get the automatic response of, but that is cruel, that is cruel to the children. This question of whether starting academic education earlier leads to better academic outcomes is a really difficult one because if, as they do at the moment, and as the EYFS will do, you teach children hard for a period and then almost instantly test them on what you've taught them, they will appear to do extremely well. But the question of whether you've educated them in the sense of doing anything to contribute to their desire to learn, their intellectual capability, their predisposition to find things out. All the things that really matter to becoming a Nobel laureate in physics or literature, um, the evidence is that you haven't. <laughs> I think the first five years in particular of a child's life are a period of very rapid growth and development where children have to explore in their own way. They're natural learners, they're almost like scientists. They're finding out using all their senses, they're learning how to be with other people. They don't need a set of targets imposed on them. As far as I know, there's no evidence at all to show that starting uh, um, formal learning early has any academic advantage. I'm not aware at all of any research that actually says starting formal education earlier is beneficial. There is a great deal of pressure on us as early years practitioners to deliver this curriculum. And that must somehow come through, um, you know, that we're watching you, we're ticking boxes, we want you to perform this for us now. There are 70 goals for children to achieve um, by the time they're five. And if teachers are required to find three pieces of evidence for each of those statements, then that's 210 pieces of evidence per child, which is a huge amount of data. And I am in a school where the children don't come in speaking English, and there's no way that my children now are going to meet their targets for this year. You know, it's impossible. we are taking away the right of parents and the belief that parents this is something that, that our parent body has felt very, very strongly about. They've been campaigning very hard against this because they feel that their parental choice has been taken away from them and that this is their human right, their, their, their right to send their children to a school that they believe is right for their child. And I think the parents feel very angry, actually, that this has been taken away and undermined by the government. It's as though the government would like to say that we have now concluded that we have the best way, we've figured out the best way that all people can learn and so there's no point you know, for us to do any more work on that creatively and this is what everyone has to do. Why should they take that position? The emphasis on information and communication technology as a learning tool for young children is another aspect of the early years foundation stage that experts, parents and practitioners have found deeply worrying. There's a growing amount of both medical as well as cognitive science evidence that exposing young children 
to screen technology, that means computers, DVDs, educational television and the like, at these early ages causes a wide range of both health problems but also learning problems which may persist uh, until you know, many years later. In particular, there's something about screen technology which seems to spoil a child's ability to pay sustained attention. And that's something that's very important to cultivate because it's thought that paying a concentrated form of sustained attention to things is a key part of what we call intelligence. Society is changing very fast, but children, little children, haven't changed at all. And uh, what they need, you can count on the fingers of one hand. I mean, they need real food, we know that now. They need real play. They need talk and song. They need love. I hope we shall see early years education going more towards developing ideas and arguments rather than the teaching of skills and techniques. professionals, trust parents, and, and also trust children, their own ability to, to explore and, and to learn from their environment. We do need to start young and really work on those human skills and not just the head. <laughs> damaging to children's ability to learn and a violation of parents' right to choose. The Minister Beverly Hughes has recently announced that only two of the learning goals will be reviewed in 2009 and that although nursery settings may apply for exemptions from the learning and development requirements, these exemptions will only be for a limited time. Parents' right to choose as a matter of human rights has not been adequately addressed in this announcement. We want the EYFS and the assessment profile to be delayed until the end of year one of primary education and for the learning and development requirements to become guidance rather than a legal duty for early years practitioners. The EYFS is fundamentally a matter of too much, too soon for young children and the Open Eye campaign is at its very heart a campaign to save childhood. If you feel strongly about these issues, please visit our website to see how you can support our campaign. I'm just going to speak very, very briefly and hand over to Simon. Um, that film was made um, six, over six years ago. Um, it was made in a particular context, but I think what's most important watching it now is that the, the, the kind of warnings that the Open Eye campaign were making um, about the, the kind of the, encro the encroaching schoolification of the early years sector. Um, over the last year um, or so under Gove and Truss has really um, accelerated far more quickly than, uh, than we thought in our worst dreams was actually going to happen. Um, and um, uh, I think that, that <coughs> what the what is useful is to start to to try to kind to, to understand um, what is lying behind this drive to uh, introduce um, children to quasi-formal learning at um, younger and younger ages, and um, and I think certainly Marxism and Marxist theory has. Um, can actually throw a lot of light on that. So Simon is actually going to say some um, something about that in his presentation, and then after he's finished, I will return to the to the issue of um, of campaigning, and I'll, I'll say a bit about the campaigns that, that are happening uh, at the moment, and um, and then we can have a conversation about about what we can do to 
challenge what, what's happening at the moment. So over to uh, over to Simon. Evening, comrades. <laughs> Very nice to be here. So, um, I'll hit you with a little bit of theory. It might be um, stuff that you are familiar with. It might be stuff that you're less familiar with. My aim is... Well, let me, do you mind if I reach no, across you? My, my aim is to, is to, to you know, give you a kind of theoretical view on why some of these um, developments which Richard has been has demonstrated in this film have occurred over the last few years. And then to talk specifically about um, the, the baseline assessment which is, which is coming in, in uh, or proposed to come in in 2016. So I'll kick off with a, with a, a bit about the testing regime in, in general. And uh, hopefully this will provoke some, some questions and some thoughts at the end. Um, now, this is the, you may regard this as rather overly cynical, but but um, uh, perhaps not. My view is that the, the 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 state's investment in early years education has never really been particularly driven by any altruistic sense of um, uh, wishing to promote uh, a holistic vision of child development. On the contrary, when a capitalist state invests in uh, a particular form of activity, be it an industrial process or a, uh, an educational industrial process, an outcome of a particular kind is expected. And what I, what I suppose I would like to propose here is that when it comes to early years education, an investment made in those early years is made on the understanding that at some point there's going to be a payback to the state of a particular kind. Right? 100 quid in, maybe 150 out, 200 out, right? It's fairly straightforward. You put your money in. You create something which we're going to call a particular kind of commodity and, and you make your money at the end of the day by moving that commodity on a market. And the commodity that we're talking about actually is the labour capacity of that child. The capacity of that child at a later stage to work within a particular form of uh, a particular economic uh, formation. And any long-term investment, whether it be in a, a, a bond or whether it be in a child, requires regular checking and monitoring to ensure that return. The state has to check on the growth which its investment is realising over time. Right? You can see where we're going with this kind in terms of thinking about testing. Right? So, early years. Now, in absolute terms, it doesn't make any particular sense to talk about an age the youngest possible age at which uh, a labour capacity may begin to be exchanged. Because, of course, we know historically and uh, internationally that the labour of children can be exchanged at any age, can't it? And very, very young. Right? And the, compa that, that, the value of that labour can be added to from a very early stage via a set of educational processes. Now, we don't tend to realise that value in the United Kingdom and other advanced industrial countries until, until a child is that much older. We're adding to the value of that commodity, the labour capacity of the child, 
but we are not yet realising it until a bit older. Marx observed that, quote, I'm going to chuck a couple of quotes in here and there because I think it's helpful. Compulsory work for the capitalist usurped the place not only of the ch children's play, this is volume one capital, but also of independent labour at home within customary limits for the <coughs> family itself. Let's just get that in our head. Compulsory work for the capitalist usurped the place not only of children's play but also of independent labour at home. Now, in the period when Marx is writing, he's thinking primarily about, about uh, factory work. He's thinking about children engaging in uh, uh, paid labour from, from a fairly early age, five, six, seven. I suppose what we now might say is that the majority of the compulsory work for the capitalist, compulsory work for the capitalist, actually happens in school. Teacher-led schoolwork, schoolwork which is not intrinsically driven by a child's particular interests, proclivities, or you know what they want to be doing, but is imposed upon them, is indeed a particular form of labour, a particular form of work, which in the longer term is actually best understood as compulsory work for the capitalist. And this is in, this is in contrast with the kinds of independent work, the kind of independent labour that a child might uh, engage with, primarily child-driven uh, uh, labour in the home. Marx gives examples from his time of things like cooking and sewing, which a child might undertake voluntarily or as part of uh, a, a, a family economy. It's just worth making one observation in this regard. This takes us slightly off the main thread of this argument, but it's something which I think is an interesting observation which Marx makes in relation to this, which is about what I would call a kind of intergenerational de-skilling. Um, he says that the process of engaging children in uh, uh, this compulsory work for the capitalist and the uh, concomitant movement of the majority of the, the work of, of the family, mum and the dad, into, into paid labour, results in an increasing reliance upon the purchase of ready-made articles, um, uh, ready-made meals, ready-made clothes, and so on. And domestic life <coughs> becomes increasingly commodified uh, as the child is moved into institutional learning from early on. The child is put in nursery. The mum and dad go out and work to pay to have that child in nursery. And part of that whole process is, of a, is, is, is Mark's notes, a change in the way in which family structures work towards a more commodified... You know, there's less about making food, there's less about making clothes, and it's much more to do with buying that, that stuff. So actually what happens is that the, um, the, the increased cost in the production of the labour capacity of the child offsets the income generated by the wages the working parent who commits their child to institutional care. So um, the... the uh, parent is spending much more of their time earning the money which is required to, 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 to buy those kinds of things. Another, another just comment he makes in passing in relation to this is it can produce what he, what he calls an unnatural estrangement between the mother and the child as the mother is moved increasingly. We, we could talk about that, it's a, it's a slightly provocative thing to say and it's certainly highly gendered um, uh, comment in relation to early years of education. Now, I think what we increasingly understand, and it was evident from that film, is that carving out and defending the space for the child to engage in free labour, call it play, if you like, <laughs> unestranged, unalienated labour, is on some level actually a struggle against the... Um, 
ever the, the almost inexorable movement of the of the neoliberal state towards the enclosure of childhood, the enclosure of childhood within a, a, a culture of of both audit and measurement, and increasingly a totalizing ideology of inculcation into the into the wage system. So actually, the capacity of a four or five year old to undertake the work of self-production, production of their own capacity to work, becomes a key battleground. Do we allow the child a degree of autonomy in that self-production, or is that self-production handed over to the capitalist state in order to produce the kind of young children who will later become the kind of older children, who will later become the kind of adults that the state requires to work in a particular kind of way. Okay, so, uh, Marx made a distinction between training on the one hand and education on the other hand. Training being that part of education which specifically has to do with the production of labour capacity. Right? Education is a wider process. Training is that part of education which is specifically to do with the production of the capacity to, to labour within a capitalist economy. Or any economy, actually. And he doesn't have any particular objection to, to training of a particular kind from about nine ish, depends on which. It's not a, it doesn't write a lot on it. But um, I suppose we might draw a, a parallel here between. It's, a, it's, not, it's not absolutely neat, but a parallel between uh, Marx's distinction between education and training and one between education and schooling in the particular sense in which we're talking about it. And the term which Richard and others use at the moment is schoolification for the early inculcation of young children into these training processes. Marx perhaps failed to appreciate the importance of some of this, and we can hardly blame him, in the context of his time, um, uh, that uh, free labour, labour of love, isn't an adornment, isn't a, 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 an added extra to our early years. It's actually a key aspect, a central aspect of our realisation of our own creative essence. So, if any of this is true, then the capitalist state would have an advantage, would seek an advantage in trying to, for instance, start school earlier. The capitalist state would, would, would perhaps try to seek an advantage in extending school days, shortening school holidays, doing any of the kinds of things which they might regard as helpful to the quicker and more efficient production of that capacity to labour which they seek long term. And of course we've seen efforts in this, and Michael Gove, as many of you in this room well know, recently proposed nine to ten hour school days, four week school holidays and so on, right? And starting school at two. <laughs> you may laugh. Now the sector, the earlier sector, the one that Richard referred to and we've seen it in that film, is not one which is broadly dominated by neoliberal thinking. In fact, there are large parts of the sector which are still very uh, favourable to progressive and child-centred thinking. And, and of course this presents quite a challenge to Gove and, and, and Truss and previously Nick Gibb and others in any attempt which they might try to gain a kind of hegemony within the sector, to try to establish their ideas as dominant within this, within this sphere. We've seen recently a lot of emphasis placed by Liz Truss amongst others on trying to establish uh, 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 some purchase for her, for her neoliberal views in this, in this uh, context. She says things like, Two men, there are too many chaotic settings, only settings, where children are running around. <laughs> it's dreadful, isn't it, running around? <laughs> when you're two or three, it's just it's inconceivable. <laughs> Run around. And there's no sense of purpose. We want children to learn, to listen to a teacher, learn to respect an instruction, so that they're ready for school. 
two and three notes we're talking about. It's not without its own internal logic, though, is it? That makes sense if what you're trying to do is more efficiently, more quickly, more rapidly get to a point where you can begin to develop those forms of labour capacity which you later need to reap a, uh, 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 the benefits, profit, from your initial investment. Now, an important feature of the attempt to reshape early education to enclose its productive capacity, then, is the establishment of an academic benchmark early in the child's life. And what we're seeing now proposed is a, uh, a, a new baseline assessment uh, for children aged four, a test uh, for children aged four, to be introduced um, in 2016. Uh, this is a couple of points from DFA, just to give you a sense of where we're going with this. As part of the changes we're making to improve the way we hold primary schools to account, we're introducing an assessment at the start of the reception year. The purpose of the reception baseline, this is children, test for children age four, is to support the accountability framework and to help assess school effectiveness by providing a score for each child at the start of reception, which reflects their attainment against the predetermined content domain. I love that phrase, a predetermined content domain. <laughs> Uh, not to assess a child against the kinds of things that a child might themselves consider to be valuable, nor indeed their parents might be considered to be valuable, but a pre-established content domain and which will be used as a basis for an accountability measure of the relative progress of a cohort of children through primary school. Now, at no point is there any attempt in that rationale to say this is in the benefit of the child, is there? Or for the benefit of the child. There is no, there's, you know, there's absolutely, it's fairly naked in its, in its intention that this is about introducing a measure of school accountability. The introduction, introduction of a test at four has a very particular logic, which is you've got to have an economic indicator which is firm early on and against which you could then measure your relative added value. Right? So, plus value. It must be strict and linear. Each assessment item must require a single objective binary decision to be made by the scorer. There is no, there is no, you know, grey areas with this with this uh, uh, baseline test, uh, test which is being proposed to be introduced in 2016. We did have baseline tests before, we can talk about those a little bit if we want to um, uh, afterwards, but the, there, it, there is a certainly an internal logic and a necessity to having a, uh, a test at, at, uh, at four which is clear cut and not open to discussion because an economic indicator cannot be, or a measure of, or, or, of uh, increase in separate value, can, cannot be grey, cannot be fuzzy. And the clear majority of the content domain, remember that, must be clearly linked to the learning and development requirements of the communication and language, literacy and mathematics area of learning from the UAS. So this is a very reductive model. We're talking primarily not about the richness of arts and music and so on. We're talking primarily about the learning of a very narrow set of skills, which are the building blocks, the small change, if you like, in that accrual of, of long-term capital towards employability. This is a process of mathematization of understanding and knowledge. Mark user identified it well as the progressive, this is a, you know, we're going way back, the progressive mathematization of knowledge and experience starting with the natural sciences developing to include many aspects of life. It's universal quantification. Focusing with increasing relentlessness upon the training demands of the market, the exchangeable skills even at the age of four. The resistance Richard will begin to talk to you about. There is plenty of resistance to this, I know there are lots of people in this room who have already begun to build the resistance to, for instance, the baseline assessment uh, test being proposed in 2016. Um, 
there is a very wide, widely held sense amongst professionals within the field, amongst campaigners such as Richard, amongst the trades unions, particularly it must be said the NUT, um, uh, currently lined up to voice their opposition. And even the government's own um, uh, uh, figures are in terms of the response to their consultation, there's only garnered 32% percent of respondents percent of respondents supporting the introduction, introduction of the base. Imagine if um, that was a strike banner. <laughs> you know, we, 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 the, the hoo-ha yesterday. Yeah. Imagine if you got 68% voting uh, against and you pushed ahead with a strike, what they'd, what they'd say. You got 68% of people voting against strike action and you pushed ahead anyway. Hmm. 68% against the introduction of a baseline. We'll give it a go anyway. <laughs> uh, and just as, an, just as a final example of the kind of uh, resistance which is building up, it's a nice quote from Neil Leach of the Preschool Learning Alliance. Many in the sector believe that the real aim of the baseline assessment will primarily be to compile data and statistics in order to compare and rank classes, schools and local authorities, when the focus should be on supporting professionals in planning for the next steps for each individual child's development. So, there is a fight on our hands here, and, it, and, it, and it, uh, it, it seems a very mundane fight in many ways. It seems a very, it seems one of these, uh, yet another one of these educational um, uh, misjudgments on the part of the government, which the unions will need to take and, and campaigners and will need to take on. But I hope, uh, uh, in, in this room and on the basis of the discussion, we can understand that it does connect with these broader issues. There is a theoretical understanding which we can bring to this about the underpinnings of, or the reasons for, introducing a testing regime for children very early, because there is a necessary logic for capital in that, in terms of being able to then measure, quantify the realisation of the surplus value which you wish to reap from that child's uh, production of their labour capacity. Back to Richard. I just, I just want to give two more truss anecdotes for people who can repeat these. The first one, uh, a colleague of mine was in a meeting with her last year where they were going through a new document for the training of early years teachers. And this truss sat um, at the front going through this document very, um, very demonstrably crossing out every reference to play in the document. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, I just heard this one yesterday, last week, Truss was visiting a centre which caters for two-year-olds and she was heard to say when she was walking around, oh these children are having a wonderful time here, that's clear, but when are they going to start learning something? <laughs> so, so this this is the mentality that we are up against, and um, that's why we're here this evening talking about this. Um, I just want to refer to two two elephants in the room. One elephant is the, is England's school starting age. Ninety percent of the world's countries have a school starting age of six or seven. We have an effective school starting age of four, and there are some very poor children who start school at the age of four years and one day. Okay. Secondly, the whole, uh, the whole issue of universal childcare, um, we haven't remotely got the time to go in, into the complexities of that. Some of, some of you will know from the stuff that I write that I'm very challenging and sceptical of this drive. It's supported by many on, on the progressive left, but in the context of the kind of stuff that we've just heard from Simon, I think we've got to think much more carefully um, um, about whether we just um, uh, uncritically support the kind of moves towards universal child care that the main that, that both of the main political parties seem to be supporting. Um, so just to kind of summarise what's happening at the moment, um, compulsory baseline assessment, the herding of two-year-olds into the schooling system, the rise of teacher-led instruction for young children, the demise of free creative play, the drive to 
reduce the early years ratios, which make no mistake, if the Tories win next year, that will be brought straight into um, policy. Um, and um, um, the uh, inspection regime and uh, sort of the, um, uh, um, the disciplining authoritarian tones that we keep hearing from Wilshaw, and this all adds up to a schoolification process. Um, I was going to say something about summer borns, but I haven't got time to do that, but I think the whole issue of the summer born campaign is enormously important. I've just been in touch with a parent who's in a battle with her um, county council over this, and the, the, the county councils are, um, are also incredibly rigid and are enormously reluctant to let parents have any flexibility as to when their summer born children start reception. So this is something, uh, and if you look in your handout on page <coughs> six, the link to the summer borns uh, um, campaign website is there. Please do look at it because it's very, very important. Um, I think that we do have to try, as Simon helped us to begin that process, to, to try to, to kind of understand um, what are the driving forces behind these processes. And I think Marxist thinking has a great deal to offer that. And we need to really think that through, to theorise it and to write about it. But we also need to campaign. Um, as Marx said, uh, we, uh, um, the point is not to philosophise about the world, but to change it. So um, the campaigns that exist at the moment that are very active are the um, Too Much Too Soon campaign that comes out of the Save Childhood movement, which has been um, holding seminars in uh, the Commons. We've got, we've got some supporters in the House of Commons, believe it or not. Um, and this is a very active uh, uh, campaign that's working with people like Neil Leach, who um, um, Simon referred to earlier. And, and what's really interesting is that the early years sector, which was which was until quite recently thought of as being very very sleepy and not really interested in politics and, and kind of getting involved in these kind of. Um, struggles is really waking up to the realities of what's happening and I think there is more there is there's the opportunity today more than there ever has been before for, for the early years sector to form a kind of concerted unified campaign uh, against the kind of changes that are being um, brought in and the uh, the National Union of Teachers uh, conference recently that Simon referred to where they passed a uh, motion supporting the idea or exploring the idea of what what's called principal non-compliance. Prin uh, principal non-compliance is when professionals refuse to introduce policies or practices with their children that they know will harm their children. This is based on the Hippocratic Oath which is do no harm and and I think there's rapidly coming a time when professionals are going to have to start saying to government, they're going to have to start speaking truth to power and to say, we will not impose alien practices on our children that we know will harm them. And at that point, there's going to be a real crisis in the legitimacy of the state. And um, with the National, New National Union of Teachers, coming in behind that. I think there's a real um, opportunity to build the kind of um, uh, alliances that can really make a difference and really send a strong message to government that, that we just will not accept these policies that, that, that you're trying to impose. And this is a time to start a conversation. So over to our chair. I'm really glad that I came to this meeting as a mother of um, a six-year-old who's in year one but has been through reception. And you kind of, as a Marxist, you think, hang on a minute, they're treating kids like workers. But you don't always kind of realise um, until you come to something like this that how 
great Marxist analysis is in terms of it can explain why a government would push through policies that the educational specialists say don't enrich children's lives. It has to be something to do with the market. Now, I don't know anything about really kind of like the new, the new stuff in terms of testing apart from the fact that testing kids is, is, is wrong, it labels them and of course always like the most disadvantaged come out even further disadvantaged. But I just want to kind of point out something in terms of, it occurred to me recently, my daughter and me are going through similar things in terms of the control that the organisations that um, ha have over us, her, her, the organisation that controls her is her school, the organisation that controls me is my uh, the local government who I work for. Attendance, right, where she is at school, they've introduced this new thing where um, each class that has like, you know, uh, is attends each week, they get a special prize. If each, if any class, any kids in that class get 100%, they get 20 quid. Any class in the school that, you know, is less, they get a tenner. Now, obviously, I'm not saying the headmaster is like a driving capitalist. He wants, obviously, an outstanding record on Ofsted so that he can have a brilliant career. And, um, but what it struck me is, they're the sort of principles that are being pushed by my council in terms of attendance records and sickness records. If you have three days off, or oh, three, three um, incidences of sickness, then you get a stage one warning. You know, that sort of thing. And um, the fact that in school, also, he at one stage said, right, um, we're going to call out 100 kids and you're all going to stand up uh, one at a time and each one of you have never had a day off sick. Uh, you know, and that is absolutely brilliant. And if every ch any child, you know, any class that is, uh, has actually managed to hi um, achieve a high attendance record that week, he will say, these kids have basically come out, made the effort, got out of bed and got into school. The logic being, the other kids, are, you know, are all skiving. And, you know, and it's, it's basically blame the parents again. And it's also very discriminatory. Because, you know, what about disabled kids? What about kids that come from quite chaotic backgrounds, you know, with parents who, who are struggling? It's an anti-working you know, anti class thing. And it just strikes me that basically, yeah, they want workers, they want the best quality workers to work in their factories and their offices. And they don't want them to think, they don't want to appreciate art or anything, they just want to basically produce profit for them. Right. Piers freed up from Wales, so we're slightly uh, sheltered a bit by some of the, from some of these things that happen there. But I'm sure it's going to come. And in fact, there's been the reintroduction of uh, of testing and so on uh, in, in Wales as a result of criticism of, uh, of how well we're doing. Uh, and what I really want to talk about, really, is, is 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 you know, it's not logical when you think about these things in terms of the uh, the results. You know, that every child feels uh, they've achieved something, they've achieved their own goals and so on. They actually feel better about it all and so on. It's actually making people fail. Because actually, actually the whole essence of a large part of the education system used to be that people used to have to fail so that some people could be seen as being good. And obviously if you're in public school, you actually had less chance of failing and so on than, uh, than, than you could there. And, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, particularly in the early years, I mean, it's uh, it, it's, it's important as well because I mean my son uh, grew up and got through uh, the trying to trying to trying to cope with dyspraxia, which is a uh, developmental problem and so on, which can be easily addressed and has been in different areas and so on, with, with widely results depending on what they do about it. But the one thing you don't want to do is sit down and try and write when what you really need is a big motor uh, motor. Uh, Movements and so on, and 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 and, and, and practicing walking around, moving and, 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 and planning your, your movements and so on. And that's really what he was done. In fact, he also found it much easier to use uh, uh, when he got to junior school a computer. And in fact, he uses it almost completely now, and it's perfect and so on. Although he had difficulty in handwriting, but that meant that of course he had to finish his work first, and then as a reward he could have the computer. So he never actually got it because he was slower and doing the handwriting. And that's really the sort of uh, background that actually grabs in there. Now he's actually working, funnily enough, in Singapore, which is seen as the model of what we really want to do. You know, kids actually, you go into some of the shopping malls, some of the smaller shopping malls, and there's little private firms all over the place that want to give extra coaching for the kids or preschool keep coaching and so on to get there. But the net result now is that this is what we really want, isn't it? It's perfect, they actually do much better than us at maths and things like that, we're saying. The trouble is that Singapore and a whole variety of other places that are held up as being models are actually really worried about the results that are happening there. The kids don't have any ability to uh, move away from very strict lines and so on of, uh, of uh, defined tasks and so on. Uh, they, they, they have lots of big kids that are actually in real distress and so on about that. The 
parents are really worried uh, and it causes a whole deal of tension. But yet we're actually still quoting this. This is what we really want to do. When people from Singapore are actually sending kids, uh, uh, people over here, to actually see some of the early learning uh, um, uh, 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 techniques that we have here. And so it doesn't really matter about the truth, does it? Uh, it doesn't really matter whether this works or not in terms of, uh, of results. What it really matters is what they want to say, which is actually a lot of kids aren't actually up to it and so on. And those that aren't up to, up to reaching the top, they've got to learn how to labour at the lowest levels. Thank you, I'm coming along in today from Manchester. I don't work in early, to, um, early years education at the moment, but I'm starting uh, to be a student in September, uh, studying speech and language therapy. And the first placement that I do will be in a nursery setting. And I've been a little bit concerned about this because um, obviously we're you know, going to be taught at university what they want us to do if we work with children in the future. So. Um, the testing agenda is something that, that you know we're going to be pushed towards. And I was speaking to a student who's in his fourth year um, yesterday of a similar course, and he said, "What what you will need to do at that assessment, which is in the first term of, of my learning, will be a case study, including a ten-minute interview with a three-year-old." <laughs> He said, it's quite difficult to find a three-year-old that will talk for ten minutes without getting distracted, which didn't surprise me at all. And I think that it shows, you know, I mean, we've, Simon was talking, um, you know, about how they're making it necessary um, for children to start to learn and to start to become basically workers as soon as they're, they're, they're in nursery. I think, um, and the separation of children from play, you know, they see its importance to that. And, you know, I'll be obviously working, it, it, I mean, this, is a, um, this will be um, an observation placement, so it, it, it will be working with children with considered to be normal development. But in the future, I'm going to be trying to help with children that are, are struggling with development, and play will be a really important part of that. But I think the unnatural estrangement from mother, uh, which was mentioned, they actually unnaturally um, estrange children from other children, trying to get each child to learn as an individual. There's, you know, there's, you know, here uh, we saw the strikes yesterday, and we know how important it is to come together and to, you know, as a society, we're not going to change anything as individuals. But children are not allowed to do that. You know, there's no copying no talking in school, you know, teachers, um, their relationship with children is is not an interactive one anymore, it's a very authoritarian one. Along with the influence of TV in society, which encourages children to grow up more quickly, um, and, you know, the genderisation that, that's forced on children. I just think it, it's, it's really difficult. I'll just finish on, on this point. The, as more and more parents are needing to work, they don't have a choice about putting the children into nursery. And it, 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 I just think it's really worrying when there isn't, when, when, even when that's forced on you, you then have taken away any options about what type of, of learning that they have at that nursery. I'm Duggan, also from Wales. I think we're being um, perhaps a little bit naive, or perhaps I'm more cynical. I don't see the schoolification agenda as being about pinning down the children. I see it as pinning down the teachers. And the other thing I see it as being, if you are going to run education for the benefit of children and their learning, you would not put three and four year olds in groups of 20 or 30. You would put them in groups of four, six. That's what we do in childminding, that's what we did do in kindergarten, and that's what we used to do in nursery. This is cheap childminding, it's nothing else. It's to make sure that parents can be released to go to work 
and if there isn't any work, they can be punished for not getting it. It's not about educating children at all, and I see the whole schoolification, which I think is a wonderful term, I see that whole agenda as hiding the truth. This is just cheap stacking of our children in little desks instead of allowing them to play. That's what it's about. I don't think, I don't think the agenda is anything other than that. It's just reducing the level of services and the social wage that we get as citizens. That's what it's about. As there's been a lot of talk, but there's a lot of people, there's people with so-called special needs, and I don't like that term anyway, because I think every child, every child has special or specific needs. But historically, people who have been labelled as people with special needs have not been given the proper rights to education because as it was so rightly said, if you're not seen as being productive, why should we put anything in if we're not going to get anything out? And that's been historically the case of pe people out of situation like myself when they talk about integrated education, but integrated education is no different to special integration and till we have inclusive education that sees everybody as having specific needs then so-called disabled children will be again institutionalized and forgotten and we need really to identify this and target that. Thank you. Hi, my, uh, my name is Tuken and uh, I'm uh, one of the Danish uh, delegates here and uh, I read uh, somewhere uh, not so long ago that in, um, in uh, 1992 there was a um, research, uh, research done uh, that said that um, early education was uh, damaging for for children and um, this ha this article has uh, not been uh, read by the Danish uh, government because uh, now they are introducing such uh, uh, learning materi materials in uh, kindergartens and uh, in nurseries where they call it the uh, uh, pole uh, that means um, uh, speed on the language that uh, the language has to be uh, learned learned um, sooner and uh, you said that uh, earlier that um, that uh, that some uh, somebody said that uh, when they play, they don't learn. That is, that for me, sorry my language, but that is uh, totally BS, because they, yes. they do learn by playing. They, uh, they learn uh, relations. And, um, and now, they, now uh, at August, uh, when the school um, starts uh, in Denmark, uh, there, there's going to be a whole day school where the children have to be in school by uh, 8 o'clock to 4 in the afternoon. Yeah, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what product, what kind of product uh, uh, do I ask myself, uh, does these uh, politicians have in mind uh, that they are going to get and uh, at last I, was, uh, I would say to the politicians, maybe your childhood, uh, childhood is over, but don't take it away from the others. Yeah. Thank you. Um.
I live and work in Germany, a country where they've just introduced uh, universal child uh, places, uh, kindergarten places for every child. Um, and working in a kindergarten is a joy because there it is a place where children get to learn through playing. They have three, four years of basically learning to get along with other children. But um, for that, there is a downside. And the downside is when they start school, the pressure is much, much greater than here in Britain. Uh, a child is allowed to, if a child goes to a good school, a gymnasium, a kind of grammar school, if a child fails more than two exams a year and they get tested on every subject twice, then they get thrown out of that school. Uh, they get labelled as a failure. Um, however, um, even with this marvellous education system that Germany has, it does have a problem. And the problem is that Germany doesn't have enough well-educated workers, um, which brings us to this. Uh, uh, they don't like the idea of having to advertise overseas to bring in skilled workers for the German economy, which is obviously doing very well. But uh, no, you know, no great secret to any of you here. Um, and so. What is the German government's response to this? Well, we have to start putting pressure on the children at a younger age. We don't, don't want to wait until they're 10 before we start labelling them as failures. Um, and working in a kindergarten, uh, up until now, when parents, the very people you would expect who would be against this kind of pressure on their children, the people who, uh, who should support their, their children learning through playing, they are the people who are coming along and demanding that I teach their three, four, five-year-old to speak English. Uh, or other people should teach them maths or reading before, before it's time for them. Up until now, I've just politely smiled at them, ignored them and carried on playing with the children. Now, I'm going to have a little bit of ammunition to show them why it's the wrong thing to do. Thank you. I'm Sarah Thomas and I'm a primary school teacher in Lambeth in South London. I want to talk a bit about um, what, what Jess talked about in the opening rally. I don't know if people were here last night and heard in the opening rally uh, what the teacher who, who was talking about the strike uh, was talking about and saying that the, the new person who has been named as the possible head of Ofsted, and this tells us a lot about uh, the government's direction of education is, is a man called David Ross. He was a, a founder of Carphone Warehouse. He had to step down from Carphone Warehouse because he uh, misused his shares. Uh, he has been named as a playboy. He was questioned uh, over a, 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 a fight at a party with a prostitute, but he's linked with David Cameron. He's a multi-millionaire. His private fortune is eight hundred million pounds and uh, he has never spent a day in front of children and he's being touted uh, as the head of Ofsted. To be honest, I don't think they, um, Gove will put him in that position because I think he's a bit of a liability. Uh, I mean, he was, he, was placed by, uh, he was placed by Johnson, Boris Johnson, as uh, the Olympic um, champion for the sustainability of the Olympic legacy. Uh, he had to step down from there because of, because of his reputation. But I think that, that kind of goes to show us, and I know um, the, the speaker here talked about a, a kind of Marxist interpretation of children as uh, being trained as the next generation of workers, but actually I think that, um, you know, that the key phrase was when Murdoch and, and, and uh, some key uh, capitalists said education is the last bastion, the last uh, sector that they want to crack open to make profit from. And if you think that in this country we have got the first free school which is being run for profit and it's one in, in Suffolk, run by IES Breckland, uh, a, a, a company uh, from Sweden. And if you saw their first Ofsted, they got inadequate in every area. <coughs> They are on a £21 million contract 
to run a school with our taxes uh, for profit. Uh, they, they, were, they were judged as inadequate for management, for teaching, for education, for achievement, for absolutely everything. But the conclusion was, do you know what, we're going to give them a few more years just to bed in and see how they do. And that just compares, doesn't it, to those of us in state schools, clinging on to being state schools, where if you, if you put a foot wrong and something goes wrong, then immediately, do you know what, you're going to be hived off to the private sector, you're going to be taken, off by, uh, taken over by this chain. It doesn't work if you're, if you're a private company uh, wanting, uh, running, a, com run, running a, um, a school, you're allowed to just carry on and make mistakes uh, at our expense. And I don't think um, this is just an early years issue, is it? It's not just the three and four and five year olds. I'm a primary school teacher. I was very proud to take part as an NUT activist in the boycott of the SATs. The SATs for 11 year olds and the SATs for seven year olds. And I think, you know, I, there are so many times when I just think we've almost got there. You know, in November 2011, 20, 30 unions on strike, I think we almost got there on pensions. I think when we boycotted the SATs, we almost got there. We had a quarter of schools that didn't do the SATs. You look at the league tables, and it's fantastic because there's just a blank for the year that we boycotted. And if we'd have continued that for a few years, there would have been, sorry, um, there would have been completely uh, useless because we could have carried on. So I think, you know, the downside is uh, we know what the problems are, but we have such potential to change things and I'm part of the, the Charter for Primary Education it's a charter along with Richard that, that we have um, and that's something that is positive it's a manifesto for education that we want to take out there and champion not just for early years for primary education for secondary education all children deserve the right to play to explore to be themselves um, I want to follow on um directly from that. I want to talk about the baseline assessment. I want to talk about the testing of four-year-olds when they come into a section class. I want to talk about the boycott of those, of those proposed tests. Right, just to give people an idea, I mean, I'm a reception teacher, so what happens in a reception class, if you've had kids in there, we know about it, they come in, and they're all very quiet. It's all a bit new, isn't it? So we spend a lot of time getting to know your child or their children in small groups. We get to know them, we get to know what they like, what really inspires them. We get to play with them in small groups. It's really very nice. It's very nice what we do. And what they want to do instead is they want to test the child in the first two to four weeks of coming into a class, right? So what will happen here, it will be like, Alana, Alana, stop crying and press the computer screen. How many, how many angles does a triangle have? And this, this, is literally what, this is literally what it will be, will be like. So, it's really vital that we, we talk about the boycott because what we want to do, we're talking actually about trying to save childhood here. Because if you have this baseline assessment, in schools anymore, it won't be about play, it won't be what Michael Walsh says, a middle class prejudice, it'll be like, put the sack, lock, lock up the sand tray, empty the water tray, we're going to sit you down, we're going to give you a pen and pencil, we're going to crack on with the really important things of reading and writing and maths. And that's all that's going to happen. And that all with the scarring of children will be absolutely absolutely disgusting. Now, there ha Richard's talked about a little bit about what's been happening. So I work in, in Harringay and Richard very kindly came up a few months ago and had a meeting for early years professionals in Harringay. And we had, at this meeting, it was, it was a very inspiring meeting, we had about a quarter of the settings in Harringay signed, a little, um, signed up to a little petition that said, we're opposed to a boycott. Right, I mean, we're, not opposed, we want, sorry, we want, we're opposed to the test and we, and we, want, we want a boycott. And that's what we're trying to do. If we can have one part of the country, one local authority, one county council, that where we can get professionals say, we are not going to test children. If we can get parents who are saying, I'm not going to put my child in a school or a setting that tests them. And if we could find a head teacher or two who'd say, I'm not going to do that in school, we could really make a huge impact. Because these, these proposed answers can come into after the next election. We want to say, to, um, to Tristan Hunt, the education, Labour Education spokesperson. I want to say to him, Tristan, do you want to test tots or do you want to save children's, save childhood? And that's the question we want to put to people. So if you work in uh, early years education, if you have a child in early years education, or if you're a head teacher in education, why not come see, down, see me like, you know, after the end of the meeting? Because if we can have one of those meetings that says, we will not test tots, we will not test children, we can really push this through and we can smash those testing and we can have a real boycott that saves children, saves childhood. Um, my name 
name's Paula Champ and I'm a nursery teacher in a children's centre in Cambridge. And I just really want to follow on from that because last week in my children's centre we held a um, primary charter seminar called Standing Up for Children, What's Happening to the Early Years and Primary Curriculum. And it's something that we um, organised through the NUT and we organised uh, with the primary charter group, but alongside uh, um, the Save the Childhood movement um, and the Too Much Too Soon campaign, uh, we had uh, uh, Max Hyde from the NUT came to speak and Sue Palmer. And it was an absolutely brilliant event, actually. It took about two or three months to build it amongst parents, teachers, governors and campaigners. Um, there was over 50 people there, the room was full, and it was really mixed. Um, and I think it did a number of things, actually. I think, firstly, someone mentioned uh, about parents and uh, what they can do. And it, 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 it's true that a lot of the parents in the room have no idea what is happening to the primary curriculum or in the early years. So it informed them um, about what was going on and about what children need. And the Safe Childhood Movement, Wendy Elliott was excellent at doing all that. I think uh, the other thing it did was give confidence to the early years practitioners, and I use that word because it wasn't just teachers, there were many people from the PVI sector and uh, non-teachers in the room. It gave them confidence to non-comply, as Richard said, to carry on you know, play-based learning and demand it up to the age of seven. And it opened the debate about boycott. You know, parents were asking, what can we do? Can we withdraw our children? And actually, the argument about how we can start to build a boycott um, next year in our school. So I would say, you know, absolutely, go ahead and organise them um, and use this plethora of experience and uh, amongst the campaigning movement in the early years, um, primary years, you know, to help you do it. This will be our last speaker before I bring um, the other speakers back. Hi, my name from South East London. And I've got a, a little six year old boy, and I'm also a governor at his school. And I think it's quite interesting that, that when we think about Marxist language and about added value, because in my little boy's school, when they're talking at the governor meetings about um, baseline testing and when they're talking about the curriculum, what well, they actually are using the words added value. Mm -hmm. And what, and you know, and, and teachers at, at this school, you know, they're, they're very, very caring. There's no doubt in my mind that the head teacher of my son's school cares absolutely about every single child in her school. But what she's finding is that my son goes to school in a very deprived area. A lot of the children come to school not speaking English as a first language. And then they are tested against schools where they have a very different experience at the age of seven and they are compared. So this the school is sort of feeling like, well, if we had a baseline, then we could test the children and we could see what the added value and you'd see how brilliant our school is. And that's kind of the experience that they're talking about. But what gets mixed up and lost in this is the experience of the child. And that's what I just want to talk about for a couple of seconds, really, which is about the experience of my own son who went to nursery school, could count very easily and very well to 10 and was doing it from a much earlier age and sort of taking, we used to sit at the table and would put one juice bottle on the table and say, if I had another juice bottle, we enough, how many juice bottles have we got? And he said, two, mummy, and I'd take it away. So we went to nursery and we had great expectations of happy days. And most of it was, but he needed to set goals. Goals for learning, learning objectives. And my son at six can tell me what his learning objectives are. And I think bloody hell, when I'm asked to set them from uh, courses for myself, I can't do this, but he can do this at six. But they weren't his learning objectives. So one, one of the things he had to do was to count to 10. So we went in the first time, Mummy, Runaf's mummy, he needs to learn how to count to ten. <laughs> Runaf can count to ten. Yeah, Miss, Mrs. Davis' his teacher said, I know Runaf's mummy, but on the day he was tested, he didn't count to ten in the way we wanted him to count to ten. So three, we go on three parent consultations, and Arunov's learning objective is still to count to ten. Of course, it's not Arunov's learning objective. Arunov wants to learn how to do a cartwheel. Oh. Yeah, so his objectives are very different, to, but they're his teacher's learning objectives. For, so eventually I got a bit upset and I said to him, what are you doing to my son when you're asking him to count to ten? Well, tell me what's happening, explain it to me. Oh, he's out in the garden playing and then Miss Hamilton asks him to come in, asks him to count to ten and he goes, what is it, ten? 
Can I go and play now, Mrs. Hamilton? It's <laughs> of course, that's not counting in the proper way to ten. He doesn't know all of his numbers. Now, the teacher knew absolutely that he could count to ten, but her piece of paper didn't say it. And therefore, every single learning objective each time and every term was to learn, teach him to count to ten. You know, so that's, that's the experience of testing on a child. Just one very, very small thing about summer babies. And this is, I work um, for a CAM service, Child and Adolescent Mental Health. And anecdotally, I have to tell you that many, many, many of the children that we see for behavioural difficulties, particularly in school, are children born in September and August. They are the children who are the youngest by almost a year in their class. And we can see, we even say to each other, check the date of birth on that child. You know, and when we look at it, and that's anecdotal, and it really does need a lot more research into this, because those children are at a considerable disadvantage to some of the other children who are almost a year, and anybody who, who knows small children know that a year in a child's life is a phenomenal amount of time at that age. Thank you all for your inspiring contributions. I didn't say at the beginning, I was a reception teacher as well for many years. And I, I teach in university now, I have done for a few years, but before that I was a reception teacher. I taught in nurseries with it as well. Um, so, um, reference was made to um, uh, some of the models that are, the, 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 the characters that we were talking about earlier on, Gove and uh, uh, Liz Truss and so on, seem to scour the world for the worst available models, don't they? If, if, they, can, if, they, can, if they can find a model anywhere of, of education, which is more reductive, more mechanistic than ours, they'll, they'll, they'll seize upon it. And somebody mentioned Singapore. Singapore, actually, the, the early years uh, curriculum in Singapore, if you have a look, is slightly better than ours in terms of uh, its progression. But, but, the, but the, the stuff that surrounds it is, well, Shanghai is the good example they've been looking at most recently, isn't it? Do you remember Liz Truss went across to Shanghai to look at the, look at the, the, the schools in Shanghai? A system where 40 or 50% of kids uh, don't go to the state schools. They go to the low, the, 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 the um, low cost private schools because the whole car system of uh, home reg registration in the home village means that if you're a migrant labourer, a migrant worker to the city, you don't actually get a place in those um, uh, state schools anyway. So the, 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 the people, the, the measurement was w which we were being measured against in terms of Shanghai schools was the most spurious, ludicrous uh, measurement. Uh, and it's worth saying, you know, it is it, the, the, for, for many of the kids who do go to those Shanghai schools, the the uh, uh, the levels of st stress and and the hours which are put into the, 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 the achieving the results which our government wishes to emulate are truly appalling. You hear those horror stories, don't you? Of, uh, uh, I know this is not the early years now, but those people working towards the Gao Kao, the the end of school assessment, and, and uh, not being told that their mother has died because it would distract them from the, um, uh, the task at hand. I mean, just, I know that's an extreme example, but we, we seem to scour the world for these examples rather than look to the places where some concessions have been won by successive waves of social democratic governments. There are examples from Finland, to some extent from Denmark, Iceland and other countries, where some concessions have been won, in the early years in particular, on... Um, uh, the intensity and the length of those hours of work. It's the same battles, comrades, really, that take place in other workplaces, isn't it? Around the intensity of the school day, the length of the school day, and so on, where some social democratic governments have made some advances. But of course, even in those countries, in Iceland at the moment, uh, since the change of government, those are under attack. They, they won some considerable concessions. Uh, I, I'm sure um, Finland will come under pressure as well, despite the fact that we, we often laud it as a great example of the kind of government that we should be looking to. A couple more very quick points. Yes, absolutely, there is this process of profit-making from education in the longer term, but that runs in, in, in parallel with the process of, or the desire for governments to make profit in education in the short term as well, and we're seeing increasing the opportunities for the, for the state system to be cracked open in that, in that way. And one last comment on added value. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? It's not very often you hear these kind of, uh, 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 something that you could interpret in a fairly clearly Marxist way being banded about in, in governor's meetings in schools, but actually this is, I'm a school governor as well. 
And in my son's school, my son's just turned eight, um, my son's school, uh, and I suppose it's in no small part to do with the fact that I'm on the governing body, we have managed to ensure that no child at any stage in that school knows what level they are. Now, you might think that's, a, that, that's, not, a, that's not a big deal, but actually, it is a really useful thing for me to say, not a single child in that school from year R to year six knows what level they are. Because it, it actually gives a completely different sense to the child of their own progression, of their own development, of where they're going. It strips away some of the, some of the mechanistic elements that we've been talking about. It's very, I mean, and, and, and in year two, they don't, they don't know they're doing SATs. They, nobody mentions SATs. They, they, the things happen, but they're done in such a way that the kids don't know that they've happened. In year six, it's actually much harder to disguise it. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they do know that they happen in year six, but even so, in that school, it's downplayed, and still nobody's talking about levels. Nobody knows that there are levels to be had. And I think once... You have parents on side in those discussions, because of course there are parents and parents, I mean, I'm a parent governor, we've had the discussions in the government, parent governors say, wouldn't it be useful to know levels? Some parents say that, don't they? Wouldn't it be useful, because for comparative purposes. And it's a, actually a long, hard argument to be had with parents about the extent to which these levels, once your child starts to be measured against uh, others in terms of these levels, become a, 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 a corrosive and damaging uh, factor in, in, their, in their child's education. And I think once parents can be one to that, and they can, as they have been in my son's school and plenty of other schools, I think advances can be made in these uh, regards in early years and across the whole uh, primary age phase and beyond. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and be very very, very quick. Thank you for your fantastic contributions. What a shame that Truss uh, wasn't here to, to hear what you wanted to say. Um, she would have loved it, Richard. Yeah, <laughs> um, just a couple of points I want to make. Firstly, what, one of the fascinating things uh, about what's happening earlier is, is, that log, is that logic and rationality and the evidence makes no difference whatsoever to these people. Um, policy making is now an evidence-free zone, uh, um, and 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 that, that that's the case actually just supports this argument that's that's been developing this evening, which is that there are forces that are so powerful um, and that and that need to be realised, not least that the needs of the economy need to trump the needs of children, that no matter what the logic and the evidence and the research showing in terms of children's development and what's appropriate for their, um, for their early learning, whatever that shows, these, pro these kind of inexorable processes will carry on. So um, that, that fact needs to be exposed we need to expose that every opportunity that we get, that it's the needs of the economic system that are far more important to these people than are the needs of children. We need to expose that again and again, every chance we get. Um, also, what is happening at the moment, this is, this is another of my hobby horses, is that the... That the politicians are trying to disguise the appalling inequalities we have in our society and they're trying to use early years curricula um, to try to, to increase social mobility and to kind of get the, the, the performance of children from deprived backgrounds higher. They're trying to use a kind of curricular route to do that rather than actually saying that 
that this society is far too unequal and that's what needs to actually be kind of addressed not to try and um, solve that problem through the early years curriculum that's what they're actually trying to do again we need to expose it something I've got from this evening is I am going to return to the people that I was reading in the 1980s which was Bowles and Gintus schooling in capitalist America and Louis Althusser, the, the ideological state apparatus 1971, because, because hearing these arguments has made me realise that we can go right back to those sources and we can map directly from what those excellent theorists were saying to what is happening in, in early years today and to really help to help us to understand um, what these processes are and why they're uh, happening. Um, I also think there's a very strong argument for taking uh, the education and the schooling system out of the out of party politics all together. And there are some there are more and more voices are being roused to say that. So that's something that I'm so I'm certainly want to be campaigning about in the future. I want to support what Terry said and what Paul has said. I think it would be great if we could all throw our weight behind a boycott um, of the, based on assessment, based on a principle of principle non-compliance. And this time we shouldn't stop short, whoever that wonderful speaker was near the end, we shouldn't stop just as we've got victory within our grasp. But we should go over the line and actually win that victory because I think um, we would be we would be doing young children an enormous service if we actually did that. Um, finally, um, sorry about the shameless self promotion. There, there, there are four copies of Too Much Too Soon. If you want to see in great detail the way that the capitalist state has been functioning in the early years over the past six or eight years, that book has got lots and lots of evidence about that. And finally, the um, handout, there, 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 there are lots that have been used. For any of you who, who, um, who would have a use for that handout, please, you know, collect them up. There's some on the front table. Take them, all, uh, um, take them away with you. Um, give them out to your colleagues, etc. if you want to do that. And thank you very much for a, a really, really excellent evening. Thank you.